Okay. I'm good now. I'll try and talk in your computer mic. Hello. Um, welcome everyone to this week's seminar. Um, people on Zoom, feel free to drop in the chat if you can't hear me too well. Um, but we're gonna get started now. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Brian Hoover, who's standing to my right, <laughs> uh, if you can't see on Zoom. Um, but Dr. Hoover is a marine ecologist based at the Fairline Institute in Petaluma. Uh, Dr. Hoover received a master's degree from Moss Landing, the Moss Landing Marine Lab, before completing a PhD at e in ecology here at UC Davis, um, where his work focused on the role of the major histocompatibility complex in mate choice mating success in the ecology of leeches storm petrels. Broadly, his work focuses on seabird predator prey interactions, their spatial ecology, and population dynamics. He has harnessed a wide array of techniques to study seabirds, including long-term oceanographic monitoring, surveys, genetic, uh, genetic sampling, stable isotopes, and microbiology. Uh, Brian's also done a lot of work to increase the accessibility of marine science as a, as a teaching and research fellow at a teaching college, as well as publishing guides on facilitating difficult conversations across socioeconomic divides in STEM. So I'm very excited to hear his talk today titled um, Seabirds, Sentinels, and Spatial Models Linking Seabirds and Environmental Variability Within California Current and North Pacific Marine Ecosystems. And so please join me in welcoming Dr. Brian Hoover. Uh, well, Sam, thank you very much for that introduction. Yeah, you made me sound really pretty interesting. That's, that's great. Thank you very much. And thank you. It's a huge honor and it's a privilege to be here. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to share my work and share the questions that I'm really interested in. Um, as Sam says, yeah, I, I'm actually a UC Davis grad, so graduate group in ecology 2018. Um, but even though my official emphasis was marine ecology, I, I never actually got to spend that much time out in Bodega at, at the Marine Lab. And it was always sort of a bummer because this is such a neat place with such amazing people doing amazing work. But as it turns out, my field sites were all on the East Coast. Um, and, and I was sort of based on the main campus and as a graduate student, you know, there was just never enough kind of time or, or reason to spend too much time out here. But I'm really glad about this opportunity and I'm really glad to be uh, working in Petaluma at the Farallon Institute where I've been for the past year because that gives me a chance to introduce myself and my work um, and the things that I'm really passionate and interested about because I'm very much interested in sort of forming and creating broader um, dialogue and sort of broader connections with the bodega community. Um, and sort of kind of after what all scientists are after, which is a broader science community in which to share ideas, to talk science, um, to, to ask questions. So I'm hoping that this can be kind of used as a springboard to um, you know, develop those, some of those connections. Um, Sam had a, oops, see arrows aren't working again. We've kind of been going back and forth to things. Uh, I'll actually skip through this pretty quickly because Sam had such an excellent introduction to sort of my past, but this is how I sort of think of myself as a seabird ecology and, a, and a, uh, in seabird ecology and the perspectives that I bring to it. Um, I started in seabird ecology in about 2008 with a master's at a Moss Landing. And really I've sort of split the two themes of my, my career since have been, have been split between two themes. And one of which is if you're a seabird ecologist, it's likely that you're gonna be spending a lot of time at sea. And about half my time and about half my publication record it's kind of based off of at sea work that I've done to collect data and to analyze data in uh, the Gulf of Alaska, in the Bering Sea, and then in the California Current. But I've also spent about half my time working on seabird colonies um, and at sites where aquatic birds come back to lay their eggs and incubate their eggs and hatch their chicks. And so my PhD here at Davis was working on behavioral and genetics questions in the lab of Dr. Gabrielle Nevitt on the main campus with these leeches storm petrels, which are shown here um, in the in the kind of image in the center. Let me use my pointer a little bit more. I'm not actually sure my pointer went, but that's fine. I'll talk it through. Um, and then I also spent a couple of years teaching as a lecturer of, of um, for undergraduates in science at Chapman University. And I think that's really helped me hone how I think about pedagogy and how I think about communicating science ideas, both in teaching and when we talk about outreach and communication to the the larger public audience that's, that's interested in marine science. And I'm really glad to be in my position now as a researcher and primary investigator at the Farallon Institute, shown off to the right, because I can really meld these two kind of themes uh, that I'm interested in. I still get to spend a lot of time at sea a couple of times a year, and that's, um, I absolutely love it. And I'm able to work on sort of broader and more complex spatial models that are bringing together the community ecology of a lot of different species in the area and working in some of that behavior and some of those traits that I'm really interested in. Um, and I'm also able to be sort of in on the ground floor when we talk about things like 
um, the internship program the Fairland Institute has started. And we just finished our second year and had a, a chance to contribute to that. Uh, work with the DEI program and, and uh, kind of statistics education program that we have going. So um, I'm really grateful to be in the role I am now close by because it's able to kind of put a lot of these things together. All right, so this is gonna serve as sort of a, a roadmap to where I'm gonna be going for this presentation. And there's really just four big themes that I'm gonna try and emphasize to you all. The first, I know this is a broad sort of marine science um, uh, uh, environment here, bodega. Some folks might have more biology interests and backgrounds and other folks not as much. So I wanna start out with about five to six to seven slides that are just kind of a basic primer to seabird ecology, why we should care about the role of seabirds in marine ecosystems and what, who, are the, who are the characters um, in that community. And I then want to bridge to talking about seabird environment interactions. Um, and I'm going to use do that by talking about this idea of seabirds as sentinels or seabirds as indicators. And I'm using sentinels in the context of something that is going to tell you about change, uh, an early indicator of change that might otherwise be cryptic or sort of hard to pick up on. So seabirds are high profile, they're conspicuous, we tend to quickly notice changes in their behavior or in their distributions. And that is oftentimes a very early indicator that something is changing in food webs that might otherwise be difficult to detect until the magnitude gets much broader. For the second half of the talk, I'm gonna split into sort of some, what are the methodologies and analyses that I've been doing lately to actually explore the mechanics of this. In particular, working with at sea data and the California Current, and I worked this up recently because I thought it would be of interest and pertinent to this bodega crowd and right out the window or in the California Current, but also the project I've been working on over the past year, which is um, really exploring some dynamics between seabirds and habitat in uh, the North Pacific, in the, in the Gulf of Alaska, and the Bering Sea. And then the last, the fourth thing, and this isn't anything I'll uh, talk about, but I just to belabor the point once more, I hope that these sort of ideas and potentially the analyses or the themes that I'm talking about you know, I hope I can emphasize that I would love to know how it might be of interest to you all in the audience, um, and, and both in terms of the work that you do, but also in terms of how it might contribute to the activities and the goals of Bodega Marine Lab. So to kind of start my, my intro to seabirds here, you know, I, I think seabirds are fascinating organisms. And one of the reasons is that they have some very unique challenges in that in order to be successful, they have to uh, be successful in three different physical mediums. So all seabirds, so I'm getting away from, you know, so I'm going kind of subtitle or out deeper, right? I love shorebirds, but we're going to talk about true seabirds in this talk. You know, all seabirds are finding their food um, on the water, or in the water, around the water. So they have to be able to locate, identify, and navigate through that environment in order to find their food. Um, all seabirds, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, are, are flying organisms. And so there are physiological and anatomical constraints that come with that. Um, if you get too heavy, even though that might help you in, in swimming, that's going to come at the cost of your ability to fly effectively and efficiently. Um, if your wings become too well adapted for swimming, if you're a wing propelled swimmer, then that's going to have repercussions for your flight ability. So there's some, some trade-offs there, right? And that all seabirds have a terrestrial component to their life history. That is that all of them come back at least once a year, or yeah, generally once a year to land um, where they're gonna lay their eggs and, and raise their young. And that tends to be offshore rocks or that tends to be islands uh, because of how vulnerable they are to predation. And the kind of really fascinating thing about seabirds is that they do this in a wide variety of ways. There's no sort of one strategy fits all. And so there's many different um, sort of behavioral and evolutionary approaches to being able to pull off and meet these challenges depending on the area where they are. So when we talk about what are the kind of traits that we should break down and think about just coarsely, how might we break down the different seabird clades and, and especially in the California area? Um, well, one of the more immediate ways that we break it down is by noticing that some seabirds are, are particularly um, sort of evolved for an open ocean existence. So this is a clip of a lay sands albatross that took a few years ago about uh, 100 miles off of Long Beach. You can see this bird, it's a large bird on a windy day, it doesn't flap its wings you know, once. It's um, exquisitely adapted for an open ocean and windy existence whereby just by twerking and shifting the position of its body with its wings kind of locked out and extended, it can very effectively using very little energy traverse huge distances. And they have another other adaptations in terms of how they smell and how they find food that really enable them to live in this open water existence. But if I were to go through and um, using, in this case, the Cal Coffee at sea seabird data set, 
and plot all of the sightings of these lace sands albatross over the last 30 years. They're plotted in blue and compare them to say cormorants, which are another bird that many of us are probably familiar with. You can see them here in Bodega Bay. You'd see immediately that there's sort of an ecological breakdown in the areas that they are utilizing. The one bird is very adapted and spends its time in the near shore environment and it's adapted for finding food and doing well in that environment. That's an orange. And then the albatross, um, there's just kind of a divide there. They're off the shelf break and well out to sea. So one of the immediate ways we think about how seabirds differ in their approaches is where they're spending time in their habitat and whether it's near shore or offshore. A second major sort of trait that we should think about is, well, how are the different seabirds effectively utilizing and integrating resources over the depth of a water column? That is, what are their diving strategies? And there are some species that are shown on the top as a storm petrel, and there's many in the California current system, that are effectively surface obligate foragers. They're going to be going along, in this case, kind of skipping, walking, hopping along the surface of the water, picking out zooplankton. Um, and so even though they can effectively cover a large aerial kind of horizontal distance, they're not really able to, to um, access food items that are below the surface. The items have to come up to the surface where they can get them. We can compare that to common murders shown in the clip on the bottom, which routinely dive down to 100 meters. It can go deeper in pursuit of prey. They have higher flight costs. They might not range as far, but they can very effectively find food deeper in the water column. Um, and we should also mention that seabirds differ in their sort of ecolo ecological niches of what they feed on. There are some species, particularly the smaller ones, that are mostly preying on zooplankton and smaller items. There are many species that are closely tied to particular forage uh, fish or squid species. And then many seabirds um, are, are rather omnivorous and they'll kind of take whatever they can fit in their beak. And so we have some sort of specialist versus generalist differences that we can think about. And so having this sort of diversity of species, I'm gonna to start to bridge now into this idea of seabirds as, um, as sentinels in marine systems. And this is a figure um, derived from, from a paper in, in, or a document in marine species management in 2011. But the idea here is that seabirds and marine mammals and to some extent fisheries, which aren't really indicators, but serve a similar role in that these are all uh, along the top, these are all sort of processes in which when something changes, these are high profile, these are conspicuous. These are things that we care about either economically or socially. And we're going to notice very quickly when you know the gray whales aren't coming by at the right time of year, or when seabirds start washing up dead, or when there's drastic changes all of a sudden to a fishery. And this reflects what is going on deeper in the trophic food web at layers which are can be a little bit more difficult to, to sort of quantify quickly. So if all of these um, at the top seabirds and marine mammals and large commercially valuable apex fish apex predator fish are feeding on forage fish, which in turn are feeding on zooplankton. This is kind of basic food web ecology, which depends on the primary productivity, the timing, the magnitude of the system. Well, when we start to get climate changes happening down on the, showing here on the bottom right, that start to affect that timing and magnitude of primary productivity, and it starts to trickle up. One of the first aspects we're going to see are changes here. Um, and so they're very useful in this regard. And there's a couple of uh, good papers and a couple of good examples that I would point to that kind of help highlight this. The first being um, a very pronounced and, and, and well-known seabird die-off. This is the common MERS story where the, the large heat wave of 2015, uh, colloquially known as the blob, resulted in this huge die-off of, of common MERS, uh, mostly up in the Gulf of Alaska, in, um, but, but kind of throughout their range. Um, and, and what was happening was that there were large scale perturbations to their to food availability due to the heat wave. And so MERS were washing up, they were starving, um, they, were, they were dying. And so they were an immediate indicator that this heat wave was having food web effects further down. Um, that was having large scale repercussions for predators at the top of the system. So they were very good indicators in that regard. You know, another example shown off here to the left is a different way to think about it. This is a paper from a colleague, Scott Schaefer in 2006, showing uh, who was the first person to track sooty shearwaters. Sooty shearwaters are one of our most common birds in the summer. They're the ones where you look out the window and they're going by in the hundreds of thousands when they're around, but they're not actually resident breeders in the California system. They breed in, in um, the Southern hemisphere, New Zealand. And in our summer, their winter, they come up here to feed off the, all the, the productivity in the California current. Um, so uh, an organism that's doing something like this, you have to think, well, if, is this really a good indicator of local conditions? Because it can range to find food wherever it would like in the California current. On the other hand, if your question is more related to how is this organism integrating resources over the Pacific, 
it might be an interesting organism. And I bring them up specifically because later on I'll talk about them. And it's very interesting to think about when they do start occurring right off our window in the hundreds of thousands and the millions, what is that saying about this kind of hotspot and productivity? Why are they here as opposed to somewhere else? So they're kind of in their own way could be potentially a useful indicator as well. I think there's other ways to think about seabirds as indicators. One way that um, this has been approached uh, was in a paper led by Bill Seidemann in 2021, which used a meta-analysis of, of uh, time series of colony data all around the world to look at trends in the reproductive success and standardized reproductive success of different species at different islands and ask sort of a retrospective, hey, can we see patterns from a meta-analysis that would help us find sort of cryptic or, or changes that, that existed retroactively that we didn't quite realize were there? And this is a map, actually an updated map, the map that we used uh, or the colonies that we used in that, that paper, colonies here shown in the, in the different uh, colored dots, were much less. This is since the publishing of that paper, um, many more data sets have rolled in. And um, so right now, sort of the conclusions from that and where we're going are that breeding success was, we found to be declining much more rapidly in the Northern hemisphere than the Southern hemisphere comparing those colonies. And this made sense because there's a lot more heat potential in the Northern hemisphere. There's more land mass and there's also more cumulative human activities. Um, there were some trait associated results coming out of that paper as well. The main one being that breeding failure was highest in surface foraging, uh, so surface limited, but fish eating species. And I should say that um, since that paper, we've had so many more, um, uh, so much more colony data that's, that's rolling in that really has helped fill in some geographic gaps and, and potentially some sort of species gaps. And uh, Dr. Helen Colleen, who's a postdoc with us at the Farrell Institute, is working this up as part of the research that she's doing um, with much more colony data. So to be able to ask much more sort of spatially comprehensive questions, but also looking into the mechanisms that help explain, so why do we see these patterns? Um, so looking into specifically how uh, ocean stratification and how some prey time series that are associated with these data sets help us explain the mechanisms behind this. And so I'm, I'm listing Dr. Colleen here because uh, definitely as you're putting together your seminar series in the spring or for next year, there's some really fascinating work to, to come out of this and I think she should kind of be high on your list. I'm gonna transition now to talking about then the second half of my talk, which is how have I been thinking about and using at sea data recently to, to kind of get at some of these mechanisms of one, how do community patterns and distribution shift over time? And two, how can we think about how to link them to environmental um, dynamics? And so the first part of this, I'm actually gonna talk just about the California current, and I'm mostly gonna talk about sort of my modeling, modeling approaches in, in sort of defining species ranges and distributions. And then for the second part, I'll talk about with the project we're working on in the North Pacific, and that's where I'm gonna to start to link in a lot more of the um, sort of environmental issues and physics. So for California, what I did, uh, and I worked this up recently because I wanted to be able to talk about some California data, was I used data from the Cal Coffee data set. This is the California Cooperative Oceanic Fisheries Investigation um, Program that is, basically represents a long-term um, uh, boat-based uh, uh, research and monitoring program that, that started in 1949 after the collapse of the sardine fishery. And it exists as a partnership between NOAA, between the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and between Scripps Institute of Oceanography. And these are quarterly cruises, so four happen a year. This grid system that I've shown here on the right, these are the actual sort of stations that the boat hits up. It leaves out of San Diego, and at each one of these dots, it stops and does about a, a two hour station visit where it does an oceanographic CTD cast. It does two to three different plankton toes, so manta and uh, bongo trawls. Um, it does water sampling and it takes about three weeks to get up all the way to the north end um, where it ends in, the, in San Francisco Bay for at least two of the cruises. And I should point out that for the summer and the fall cruises, it only goes, the, it's only the first six lines, so just north of Point Conception. But for the winter and the spring cruises, they, it's about three weeks and it goes all the way north. Since 1987 or so, seabird surveys have been added to this. And so what I've done here is I've showed those same stations, but I've plotted all of the lines that represent seabird effort here. And you can kind of see a couple of things here, one of which is, yeah, you're surveying along where the boat goes, but there's a lot of adaptive and opportunistic surveys that happen as well. Things come up, weather hits, uh, boat logistical problems hits, COVID hits, all sorts of things that might deviate you and get the boat going off schedule. And anytime the boat is moving, the seabird observers are observing. 
it's kind of shown down here in the bottom left. The observer will be on the port of the starboard side. They're going to be looking out in a sort of 300 meter grid cell continuously as the boat's transiting. And they're going to be recording the species they see, the number of species, and sort of the basic behavior. Is the bird flying? Is it on the water? Is it foraging? And, um, and so this allows you to, to really gather a very large data set quickly. So what I wanted to do was because in spring and in winter, this, this data set extends all the way up into the Bay region, and that's a little bit closer to us, I decided to focus on those two seasons and do some sort of analyses and mapping to be able to, to talk today about a little bit about what is the seabird community in this region over these seasons kind of telling us. And so I'm going to start with some sort of just more general patterns. And this is just no modeling. This is just using the, um, the seabird data. And I've made some 75 uh, kilometer in diameter polygons here to ask sort of some traditional metrics and how we think about community kind of systems. So these first two, the, the top one is a, a diversity index, the Shannon Wiener index. So this is a reflection of both how many species, but also how evenly are the species partitioned in each one of these blocks on average over time. The second row here represents the number of species found on average in that block over time. And then on the bottom uh, rung, I did some back of the envelope kind of calculations quickly where I looked up the mass of each one of the species that we have records for, and I multiplied it by the total number of individuals. I divided that by the number of years to get basically sort of a mean indication of where's just the mass of birds in the California current. And so what we can see here is that there's sort of a mosaic pattern. There's, there's a lot of um, variation in the, in the top two that even though the, the biomass is all along the coast, and yes, for the most part, that's where our richest sort of diversity of species are. But there's plenty of open ocean you know, species and high diversity that are out there off the shelf. Um, there may not be as many in, in, in number, and it may be kind of mixed as to where they are from year to year, but there is a lot of kind of larger uh, diversity in the California current and off the California current system. I'd like to break this down a little bit more in terms of sort of the big uh, bird trends that I talked about earlier. And I put some sort of uh, similar patterns on this first slide. So this kind of is, is um, gathering on the top. These are our non-breeders. So birds that are generally from the Southern hemisphere from elsewhere, but they visit the California system, particularly in spring. Um, and then in the middle are our breeding kind of diving birds. So cormorants, murres, uh, birds that are very good divers, but tend to be tied a little bit more closely to land. And then at the bottom, it's a breeding surface foragers. They're limited to surf feeding at the surface. These are things like gulls um, and pelicans, and they also breed in the system. And what all of these show in common is they're, well, at least for the, the first two, they're relatively dispersed in winter or simply not there in the case of our shearwaters. And then in spring, you get this immediate signal and pulse right along the coast. That's where the food is, that's where things get productive, and that's where they show up. In contrast, at the bottom, the breeding surface foragers, they don't deviate much. You're, you're going to be close to land. You're going to see them in the same spot in winter that you're going to see them in, in, in the spring. Contrast this then with this next slide. These are our uh, surface foragers that, uh, for one, are sort of the breeding small planktivores on the bottom, the storm petrels, and on the top are the albatross, the species that we have in the California current, all breed in the summer, but they breed in Hawaii. Um, and we do see them off of our waters in winter, and we do see them in spring. And you can see how these sort of off-shelf species are utilizing much more of the off-shelf habitat. It's, it's, it's more dispersed. The albatross in particular in both winter and spring are along the shelf break kind of area in their highest numbers. Um, and the planktivores are, are pretty dispersed in the winter. And then where we see the hot spots in the spring are more associated around where some of their colonies are. So this is interesting. This gives us a baseline pattern. We can also do better than this, I think. And so one of the things I want to emphasize here is that at sea data, well, it provides a lot of data and it's really cool. And I put some of those data metrics on the top right. Things like, you know, just in the spring and winter data that I was looking at, it's about 64,000 three kilometer transect bins, about 162,000 kilometers surveyed, almost 400,000 birds sighted representing 80 species, about 80 species. There's a lot of data, but it's also noisy data. And if I start breaking this down by individual years, you can see some of this noise. In some years, you don't get out as far as you hope to. In some years, you don't get as much effort as you wished. COVID years in particular, in particular played a lot of havoc with our ability to get effort and and get the same sort of amount of effort as usual. So when you start thinking about modeling approaches, you really need to think about what's going to give me the best chance of effectively and accurately 
interpolating into temporal and spatial gaps that are simply a reality of working with at sea data. And so the sort of way that I think about this approach is that, you know, what we're aiming for is something like what's shown in the bottom right hand corner here. We're aiming for a species distribution model and maps that accurately tell us or that are telling us something about where these species go. But the reality is that this is reflecting a lot of um, uh, inputs coming from the top. There's these species have variation in time associated with all sorts of things. These species are showing variation in space. And both of those things are going to be filtered through the prism of you have variation in survey coverage from year to year. So that's partly what's dictating the results of your model. On the left side, there's also a lot of biases and detection effects. There are differences depending on what kind of vessel you're making your observation from. Is it high off the water? Is it close to the water? That's going to impact your ability to identify and see different birds. There might be variations across observers and how well they can identify species. And there's certainly variation that is associated with weather. So when you have a model, you you have to realize that, you know, if a seabird model, an FC model, that your final product is kind of reflecting all of these biases and all these processes that are going on. And one approach that's been somewhat useful in dealing with this um, are some of the sort of larger um, customizable generalized linear mixed model frameworks. Um, and I used one called a VAST or a Vector Autoregressive Spatio-Temporal Model. Uh, this is a model that was developed in the sort of ground fish modeling world for, um, by Jim Thorson at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center. But it's similar in many ways to the SDM, TMB um, sort of spatial models that some of you might have used um, if you're doing some spatial modeling. They have different, um, I think they have different advantages and different features, but they're similar in many ways. And so traditionally, this has been used and has been used for a number of years now in modeling uh, fish stocks. But recently, a paper came out last year showing that it was also a fantastic tool to be able to model uh, seabirds because they have some of, many of the similar problems and patchiness and gaps. So this was a paper written by um, Yumi Aramitsu at the USGS with uh, many colleagues, including some Fairlawn Institute colleagues. Um, they kind of set up a, a roadmap for the, the ways you can apply this to bird data. And I've been using this as a roadmap to try and uh, work on uh, applying these models to at sea data myself. And so to put this in sort of a, a general uh, format, the choices you have when I'm making these models are, well, we can choose to model species by itself and a univariate approach, or we can choose to combine species in a joint species dynamic model. We have a number of um, sort of variables that we need to go through and define about how we're gonna treat variation in space, in time, in space time. What sort of uh, predictor variables do we think are highly important at fine tuning our estimates of where birds go? And then what are our sort of um, random effects in terms of detection biases? Uh, these are called detection and catchability um, variables or predictors. Um, one of the ways that you can apply this model in the way that I have is to model it in a traditionally split or what's called a hurdle approach. There's a lot of zeros when you're surveying, right? You don't see anything, you don't see anything, you don't see anything, you see 100,000 street waters. So that data is skewed to the effect that you have to kind of first model an encounter rate or presence or absence in what you encounter. Then when you have positive sightings, you also have to model the positive, um, the positive densities, which also tend to be highly skewed. Like you see a bird, you see a bird, you see 100,000. So you have to have the right data distribution, which is usually a log normal or, or a gamma distribution to deal with that kind of right-hand skew. And then finally, we define the area that we're interested in. So in our model, this looks something like this. I have the area I've already shown you. I've circled it and this is the area that I'm, this is my area of inference. I've gone through and I've made some choices about how I'm going to model some of these different parameters. And I can go through these in depth later for anybody who's interested. And then I went ahead and I chose a number of species that I thought represented a good sort of, uh, you know, breadth of some of the functional taxa doing different things that we have in the California current. Some are associated with warm water, some cold water, some are resident breeders, some aren't. And I wanted to see what we would get. And I ran some joint uh, spring and winter models and I ran some separately. Um, and I'm going to go a uh, blast of the past here from about a month ago. Hopefully many of you in the audience remember this talk because it was great in the seminar series. Dr. Marisol Garcia Reyes gave a talk about upwelling trends and sea surface temperature in the California current. And I borrowed this slide from her presentation because I think it helped set the stage. One of the results that she took in looking at this, um, at this uh, image on the lower left was that in the California current system, and this is over the last 40 years, in the North and the Central California current system, there was really no significant changes in what we would call coastal sea surface temperature. Although there were some increases in winds in February, early in the year. 
But in the Southern California current system or the bite in contrast, there was definitely increasing sea surface temperatures. So I'd love to have you kind of keep this in mind as the sort of background of the foundation. When I start talking about different bird trends, this is the context in which, you know, I think we should be thinking about it. So going through, and I, I kind of just went through and I want to show just a few of the results, the significant results. How am I doing for time? Great. So I want to show some of the um, results that I thought were interesting out of these species. So one of the outputs is that you get uh, your model. And I chose to run this model in a five kilometer grid resolution. And for this particular species, which are storm petrels, they're the ones that are planktivores. They're feeding a little bit offshore. And you can see that from year to year, yeah, their distributions that kind of show some shifting hotspots, but they're not common close to land. They're common a little bit further out. And some years we see them a little bit more off of sort of Monterey Bay and the Gulf area. And some years we have some hot spots off of uh, Point Conception. But if I look at the actual estimates, the, the abundance estimates that come out in this model that I ran, and I, I should say this model explained about, the best one I was able to get up to explained about 45% of the variance, which for this amount of birds over this amount of time um, was pretty good. I was happy with it. Um, I'm sure we can fine tune it more, but I think it's pretty good. This showed an actual decrease then in these, these storm petrels numbers um, over the 20 years that I'm looking at then. There's a couple of things I want to emphasize and highlight in this plot. First of all, is that even when you get a trend with seabird data, it's likely to be high, highly noisy. You can look at the variability there and see how much it bounces up and down. And this is just always going to be a feature of these large scale at sea data sets. Um, so we do have a trend here, and I, I'm very interested in learning more about this, and there'll be some slides coming up in which I can expound further. But it is noisy. It doesn't necessarily explain a lot of the variation, but it seems pretty accurate that these numbers are have a, have a, a significant slight downward slope. Um, another species. So these are common MERS. Um, they're very common, particularly th their range, if you look at the maps, is point conception and above. It is fairly rare. Sometimes you see some, you see big numbers off point conception, and sometimes we see them in the Santa Barbara Channel. But this is really a true cold water California current species. And the maps obviously reflect that. They're coastal, um, they're, the numbers are point conception up, up north. And this really is the southern range of the species. Uh, there's, there is now a breeding colony um, on one of the Channel Islands, but it is the southern range. And this species does go all the way up into Alaska. Um, and this is a case where I think the modeling um, maybe works, maybe it doesn't necessarily work. So it shows not much of a change. That's a, a lot of variability, but it's very stable. Um, on the other hand, in looking at the largest breeding colonies in California, which are on the Farallon Islands, just offshore to us, those uh, the, the number counts from year to year are about 350,000 birds. And this is saying, you know, about a million. So this is, there's a couple of things that might be going on here, but it's worth talking about. One is that your 350,000 or so birds from year to year on the largest colony in California don't necessarily represent all the young birds and the breeders, which are still out to sea. MERS don't tend to come in and recruit and start breeding until about five years of age. Now, if you're going through and you're surveying birds in the water and you're picking up breeders and you're picking up non-breeders and you're picking up uh, immature or juvenile birds, is that going to be enough to double or even triple the number that are on the islands? And I don't know the answer to that. I'd like to talk more to some specific mer biologists. There will be a lot more. Is there this many more? I'm not sure. Or is this an element where when you get highly patchy, super concentrations of a bird like mer, is this something where the model struggles with a little bit and it's interpolating and making a higher projection than it should? Um, but I do think it's interesting because we rely on these colony counts to tell us something about numbers and trends in the, in the system. And the at sea data is actually providing a very different data source because you are getting these age classes of one to five year old MERS or four year old hanging out in the area or non breeders or prospectors. And I think it remains an open question at how well it's capturing these kinds of trends. This is a kind of cool one, and I wasn't able to find get it to fit any significant models using a GAM or polynomial approach, but this is brown pelicans. Um, they're a coastal species. They're more of sort of a tropical to subtropical species. We see they mostly breed in the Channel Islands and, and well down into Baja. And we see the numbers here associated really with the Southern California bite. But obviously, we have many, many pelicans here. So they range broadly. So they're, they're, um, the model estimate is really quite cool. It kind of shows this increase. It shows the sinusoidal kind of effect. And what's going on here is if you look at the northern anchovy stocks, which is what this species primarily preys upon, it has a very similar dynamic. 
So here we have uh, a trend that fits very closely the trend of its primary prey item um, and might then reflect how that prey item is itself uh, associated with the environment, right? So this is sort of a, a predator prey story that I think is pretty, pretty interesting. Um, I dropped the maps for the moment. They're fun, but they take up space. And I just wanted to show trends now for our four. These are the four non-residents. These are the ones that come to the California current uh, in our summer. Um, our summer for the for the uh, for the sooty shear water, the Cook's petrel and pink footed shear waters, at least. They come here um, in our summer in their non-breeding season. And then the black vented shear waters actually do breed down at the kind of tip of Mexico, but in the winter, they come up here in large numbers. So I showed these because these, these were kind of some interesting results. The pink-footed and the sooty shearwaters, I'm going to kind of call them more temperate species. And for the most part, there's just noise. There's a, there seems to be a trend there. It is not significant. Um, uh, most papers on sooty shearwaters say that sooty shearwaters actually went through a decline before the 2000s in the California current before I started. So what's likely happening is here is that these birds kind of have a dynamic that's oscillating. They ebb and flow. Some years are high. Some years are low. The last couple, six, seven years have been high. And so it seems like there's a bit of a trend, but it, it might go lower. They go back and forth. On the other hand, there's the two warm water species. Those are cooked petrol and black vented shearwaters. They're just going higher. These are fit with a linear model and, um, and it's very significant. So there's a different process going on here. And it's a process I'll call the sort of tropicalization of, of the Southern California environment where it's getting warmer, food webs might be changing somewhat there, and species that are from traditionally warmer environments um, are moving in, likely with some of the, the forage species that they feed on in the area. So if we pick the right species, we can see some indications of, of changes happening that are reflecting the environment. We can also ask things in a different capacity or different format. What if I took a map here and I said, you know, I'm going to go ahead and calculate the spatial mean of this map. Where is on average the latitude and longitude coordinates that represents the spatial mean of this population this year? And that's shown by the red dot. I can also go through and calculate what are the sort of ranges? In other words, from the top, what's the line at which 90% of the density is below this line? And at the bottom, what's the line at which 90% of the density is above this line? And in this particular image, it, it gives me sort of a range limit there. These might be interesting metrics in their own right to start to think about how does this change over time? So what I've done is I've taken this and I've plotted it for each species uh, year to year, which is along the x-axis, and then it's the latitude along the y-axis. So you can think of the sort of the, um, the top line then as the northern 90% range limit. And you can look at how it varies over time, and the bottom line being the bottom 10% uh, range limit. And I've lumped them by sort of similarities and functional traits. So that top line are these are the local breeders. These are birds that are breeding in the California current system. And I think the main thing you can look at there is that it's, it's really quite stable. And it might be quite stable for a number of reasons. One of those being these birds are tied to their colonies. There's only so far they can go, perhaps. Um, on the other hand, our non-resident breeders that are more temperate, that are kind of associated a little bit with more colder water, that's the middle line in green, it starts to get more dynamic. Uh, the, the southern kind of boundary there for the pink-footed shoe waters is pretty stable. Um, but there's a lot more noise. And then we go to our warm water, those two species that I showed previously with the significant linear model trends. Look how dynamic their northern kind of range limit there is, right? This is them pushing into the area with that northern limit being very obviously tied to some sort of either food or environmental or environmental food conditions. So this is where I'm going to um, end the, the kind of California component of this because I want to spend the next five to 10 minutes talking about Alaska. But I think this has been a really fun direction that I'm, I'm really excited about exploring more um, with, with my colleagues at the Fairlawn Institute and with anyone else who's interested. Because I think this is, um, you know, we can start to think about how do we fit these to upwelling indices or ocean climate variation indices like, like MOSI um, or sea surface temperature trends um, or food trends that we can find and get an example of is this indeed sort of a, a leading edge of tropicalization in the California current, and can we kind of figure out the mechanisms behind it? So um, I'm going to switch now for the last part of my talk and talk about using those same modeling approaches, so using that vast model. For the last year uh, and a half or so, this is actually what I've been working on for the most part, which is a large project funded by the North Pacific Research Board. Um, 
that seeks to use this vast modeling approach over a huge expanse of the North Pacific to ask some complementary but very, very broad questions. And there's three big central questions uh, associated with this project, and I've been sort of the main analyst for all of these. And the first is to say, if we took um, uh, if we took a large data set of birds that have been um, kind of surveyed from a variety of projects in the area, and our sort of area of inference is what's highlighted in, in gray there, and we started modeling them using VAST over the last 20 years, um, and particularly interested in two species, how well do the at sea trends fit the trends at nine or I think 10 individual colonies in the system? Because as I talked about, there might be differences. We might expect that they co-vary. On the other hand, they might not. These are very different processes going on between these two data sources. So I have, um, I have colony data with sort of reproductive success trends from each of these colonies over the same time period. And I've been modeling the at-sea distributions for two core species we're interested in, which are black-legged kittiwakes and um, common thick-billed murres. And going through and asking, how well do these kind of match up? So that's one of our big projects. The second project, the one in the middle, is a project that is using now 46 years of data in a decadal model. So this is lumping species by decade. Species in the 70s, what are their trends? All, a number of uh, species in the 80s, what are their trends? The 90s, 2000s, 2010s. And we're doing we're using that approach because we want to link it to um, one parameter of how climate is changing in the area. And this is called the velocity of climate change. And I'll talk about this in a slide coming up. And this is what I'll focus on kind of for the rest of the talk. And then the third large project I'm working on is breaking down this area into three different sort of domains, which is the Bering Sea, the Southern Bering Sea, the North Bering Sea in Chukchi and elements of the Arctic and the Gulf of Alaska. And for that project, we're talking about seasonal changes. So I'm going through and I'm applying the VAST model to the spring, so April, May, and then June, July, and then August, September, and October, November. And we're asking the question, how are birds shifting and moving between seasons in this large area? So these are large projects. They're tough models. They've been taking some time, but we'll use the same sort of procedure I referenced in the earlier ones. And I'm gonna talk about in specific project number two here and some of the results that we've been finding um, with that. So, if I were to look at all the effort for this area over 46 years for this particular project, there's a lot. Um, it's not to say that in some years it's not quite sparse, it's still gappy, but there's a lot of data to work with, which is why we wanted to use this approach and um, to, to kind of link to, to modeling. The approach here is if I take, for example, this is the output for one of my species, and this is sort of a density grid. Uh, this is for albatross. And so if this is what the VAST model is kind of giving me for a particular year, well, I've been working a lot with, um, with Gamma Caval, and particularly on this project. And we're going to ask, can we take this and can we convert that into um, those grids into sort of what's been happening across our four different decades? So here we have the 1980s, uh, 1982 to 1991 up here in the top left, 92 to 2001 in the top right. 2002 to 11 in the bottom left and 2012 to 2021. And all this is doing is taking that grid and it's applying a kernel density plot to it to make it a little bit easier to understand what are the actual ranges here, right? This can be kind of messy. This is a little bit easier to understand. And it's also showing then, Gammon here is overlaid on these plots. Here's where the bird was, uh, for example, this um, blue dot here is where it was in the 70s. Here's where it's moved to in terms of its spatial mean in the 80s. And the kind of blue line here is, uh, connects it. So it largely went west, the, the distribution for these albatross in, in the 80s. Going over to the 90s, I'm sorry, it went east. Going over to the 90s, it goes way back west, further than even started in the 70s, right? Into 2002-11, it goes kind of back to the middle of where it started. And then from there, it goes way back over to the west again. And so these are telling us two things. It's telling us where the spatial mean is moving. And it's also telling us where the range limits are east, west, and north, south. So this largest bubble is capturing 80% of the data here, right? So we can use this and start to ask it very specifically in the context of a key environmental parameter. And the one we've been interested in, it's called the velocity of climate change. So this is an index that um, has been worked on, developed by a number of different folks. And the idea here, these are maps shown for uh, similar periods that overlap with the birds. And the idea here is that these, these maps and the kind of relative hotspots here reflect the rate and the direction of the change in marine isotherms. Isotherms being lines that are connecting locations of similar temperature, right? 
the way to think about this biologically that we've kind of come up with is that it essentially it's describing the, the speed and the direction that a species at a given point in space would need to move to, ma to maintain that same, in this case, temperature. So this is how I'm kind of choosing to visualize and think about it. This species here uh, that's in the, in the dark red, uh, it is saying that it is heated up so much here that it would need to move about 50 kilometers per year to find a location that is the temperature at which that decade started essentially, right? Versus in this kind of cooler area right here, well, this is saying that an organism here would need to travel, if we look at our scale bar, not as far, about five to 10 kilometers a year to find a location as warm as the spot used to be. So all this is is providing us a predictive map on if you're here and your organism might care or have thermal limits, this is how much it might be predicted to move or have to move to find a spot that's, uh, with similar characteristics as when it started in temperature. That's not to say the organism will do that. That's not to say the organism even cares, but that is our prediction that we can use to make hypotheses. Another way to think about this, because this is direction as well as magnitude, is that Gammon's gone through and fit uh, arrows here. And so this is showing the arrow, the direction a species would have to go to find that temperature that matches its original characteristics. And we could see some broad patterns here. The biggest one being that in the Gulf of Alaska, we have a lot of east-west movement, essentially. This is saying that for the, you know, an organism to find that, that spot that was most similar to how the decade started up in our top left, it has to move west. It has to move west by quite a long distance, I mean, 50 kilometers a year. So you add that up, you know, that's a lot of kilometers per decade. Um, and in our one decade, which is a little bit different here, the 90s, uh, 2009s, the 20 year period, it kind of shows things going the other way. Um, and in the Bering Sea, our pattern is largely north south. So the things I guess I want to emphasize and keep in mind, it's east west in the Gulf, it's north south in the Bering Sea. So let's go back to some of our KDS plots. This is a KDS plot for uh, some of the auklet species combined. And this shows, for example, okay, well, if we're looking at the birds, well, the birds went kind of southeast in the, in the first decade, then they went pure west, then they went southeast again, and then they went north. And so we can start to ask this question, what if we make correlations? What if we take those center of gravity plots and we take our range limits and we say, how well did they correlate? The prediction here for this one is that it's moving north-south. It should be moving north-south in concert with that north-south VOCC movement, right? East-west, it might not care as much. There is some east-west movement here, but it doesn't seem to be the main thing. So our prediction here would be like, is this north-south movement correlated with north-south VOCC movement, or at least north-south VOCC predictions? So four last plots here, just want to show some of the preliminary results that we have from this. We've combined a couple of species where we thought due to traits of where these birds were breeding and where they lived, these are the species that should show north-south movement. One of them, which are common mer or mers and thick-billed mers, the blue line, uh, not so much, and the black line fits the trend for both. But the other one, uh, which are auklets, you know, it's it's four data points and that's a limitation, but that's a that's a line that seems to suggest there's something there. So let's look now, this was the COG or the center of gravity, that spatial mean. Let's look at the range limits. Uh, range limits here, well, we lumped a couple of more species because in the range limits, there's there were more species that seemed like that might be a factor. Well, there's really only one that's playing nice. And again, it's our auklets. The rest, we don't see nearly so strong of a pattern that we would think would fit our prediction. Let's look at east-west movements quickly. So in east-west movements, we thought, uh, you know, again, there should be a positive line here. Essentially, if the bird is moving more and it's because of VOCC, you'd have a strong positive correlation. That's what we were looking for. We only see that kind of with one particular species, the top pink line. Those are storm petrels. The last plot here, we'll talk about range limits that are east-west. Again, we were hoping to see a positive trend. This one is a negative trend overall, meaning the more VOCC is, the less birds move. So that's, uh, they don't care at all. But there is one positive trend here. And again, it's the storm petrels. So what does this mean overall? And these are my last you know, three slides I'll end up with. There's an interesting effect here, and that is that both storm petrels and auklets are planktivores. They're the only planktivores in the system for these models that I ran. So it might be that as things heat up for this VOCC, which is using sea surface temperatures, and planktivores eating plankton, one's a diver, one's a forager, but they're they're mostly up at the surface in the photic zone. It might be that they are indeed tracking um, velocity of climate change statistics because their prey is heavily affected by these sorts of events. And we know 
from work that many folks have done that some copepods and other vertebrates have these thermal ranges in the Gulf of Alaska. They do care. It does affect species composition. It does affect species distribution. So if you're after the right species and asking the right question, it may be that you have some tracking. On the other hand, there's plenty of other taxa that are moving around. They're just not moving around in a pattern that seems to fit the velocity of climate change particularly well. And that might be because they're responding to other cues or they're following prey sources that are deeper in the water column or the UCC is not the statistic that you might want to be after to help explain that. So in a larger sense, this is the what does it mean for those results, but in a larger sense of I think where I want to end my talk about what are all these things mean that I talked about, I was reminded when I was going through this, uh, when I was doing my master's, there professor there's a professor, Dr. Greg Kaye, an ichthyologist. And he was more of a sort of a systematics professor, but some of his students would sometimes do behavior that I think would drive him nuts. And so, you know, one of his quotes was, when faced with a decision, an organism basically does whatever the hell it wants. Mm -hmm. And I know it can seem that way. Uh, I don't think seabirds are any more capricious or volatile than any other organism. But I think it does reflect that these animals are responding to a wide variety of cues. We think a cue might matter. We think a parameter might matter. We apply it. We have a hypothesis and a prediction. It, it maybe works and maybe it doesn't. Um, and it's really intriguing and interesting to see that planktivore result, for example. But the, these sorts, you know, animal and animal distributions at seabird data, they, they go where they go. And there's a lot of noise. And one of the challenges is trying to understand and figure out why are they doing that from year to year. Um, but we can increasingly quantify seabird movements and patterns using the at sea data. And some of these new models that are coming out really enable us to, to do that in new and powerful ways. Um, and I guess I would just end at the last by saying, you know, I've, I've tried to talk broadly about seabirds, including the California current. And I would just encourage um, some reflection and thought about, you know, what is the presence or the absence or the behavior of birds um, in your own study systems? What can that help tell you? How might you think about working that in? Whether it's you know, shorebirds, seabirds, or, or, or land birds. Um, I think those are worth questions worth having. So I want to just end up by thanking a lot of the collaborators that I've had in this work. Um, it wouldn't be possible um, without an expertise and collaboration and advice. And um, we ran a little bit long, but I'm happy to take any questions online or here. I'll just get some instructions to go on sure. Zoom. Um, thank you, Brian. That was an awesome talk. It gave super clear and ton of data and gave me a lot to think about. And I don't even study seabirds, so that's awesome. Um, if you're on Zoom and you have a question, feel free to drop it into um, the chat or uh, into the Q&A. And I'm going to rely on you to read the question out loud no um, and answer it. But in the meantime, if we have any questions in the in-person audience, yes. <laughs> Yeah, so actually, I think I glossed over that part. Thanks for that question. So the question for those folks in the audience was when we're calculating the velocity of climate change, do we use sort of different spatial ranges in, in domains? Oh, the grid size. So the grid size was fit to the same grid size as the birds were, which I believe is 100 kilometers. Is that right, Gammon? So so we fit it to the, the size that I was modeling the bird output to match that up. Um, we could change that in terms of the overall pattern. I'm not sure how much that would change. But the other thing I'd want to mention then is, let me just scroll back to some slides real quick. Let's see. When we calculated it, we calculated the VOCC only within the footprint of the largest possible spatial range of that species. So for example, the VOCC wasn't calculated for the entire domain, which would have been the Gulf of Alaska as well. It would have been calculated for the red 80% footprint. Um, so something more pertinent to that particular species, right? So that was something I uh, forgot to mention. But the, the grid size, yeah, it is, we limited it to 100 kilometers and I'm not sure how that might affect the changes. I think it's, it's very sensitive to if you get really low spatial seas, spatial rivers, and you have uh, a time cycle, mm -hmm. and you get a trend that expands on that. Uh, if you have low areas between one point and the other, then you get really high velocity density, velocity density, and then you increase the hit by the advancing by 
That's good. Yeah. Well, that makes sense because it's just kind of the strength of the gradient in the second you can see the same size. Yeah. So uh, that's a good point. Um, I think that's something we can play with more as a kind of preliminary and trying to figure out how to map patterns. And it may be that we can match patterns a little bit better if we're getting a kind of different kind of pipe. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Thank you. Yeah. Brian, thank you. It's fascinating to see what you can do with these long data sets. <laughs> um, you you uh, said that for the brown pelican, um, uh, fluctuations up and down and that matched pretty well with sardine data set for anchovy yeah anchovy sorry um how about the two uh, southern species that are moving northward do the data exist do you know what they're feeding on and, and what those populations have been doing yeah great great question um you, the southern the subspecies of anchovy or pelican no, i mean no, the, the, um, uh, let's see, the Cook's petrel and the black shearwater, oh. which are moving northward. Gotcha, right. Um, and I wonder whether there's trophic information to explain that. There is in papers. I'm, I'm a little, because I don't recall it exactly, I'm a little hesitant to say. The, the shearwaters absolutely will feed on anchovy uh, when they come in. Um, I think their diet's a little more diverse otherwise. Um, and I don't know what they regularly feed upon in their in in their core habitat range, um, but I do know and have seen them feeding in concert with other fish with other birds on on anchovy when they do come up into our system. Um, you know the Cook's petrels are so far offshore, and I I believe they're kind of most of the literature says that they they have a wide variety of food items, um, certainly fish, but also a lot of the offshore birds are feeding on squid. They're feeding on mesopelagic deep sea things like mctophids. That are offshore that are coming up to the surface at night. I think a lot of those offshore species tend to be strongly nocturnal in some ways that we don't really understand. And and so I think those the pteridroma, like the Cook's petrels, they're a little bit more omnivorous in what they're feeding. But it's a question worth looking more into, which is to say, you know, are they following their food sources up here? Are they finding new food sources? You know, what is it that's changing as they come into the area? And uh, I don't know that I have a definitive answer for you just yet, other than that's definitely something to start thinking about more. A question to okay. Uh, yeah, I'm sure I didn't miss you. Um, so the question is, do results so far suggest that seabirds of particular species measure any more uh, any components of environmental change more easily than direct measurement of these that these components could um yeah wow geez <laughs> good question <laughs> uh, yeah i don't know i mean part of the answer would be that sometimes direct measure of of certain environmental components can be tough um I, I think seabirds are valuable in that measuring them to indicate environmental components helps helps you understand something about the system. What are the consequences? What are the results of that environmental change or that component? Does it matter at all for certain elements of the biology in the system? And I think that's why we ask that's why we ask these questions. Um, no, if you go after if you're using seabirds as a you know to indicator of a particular thing, yeah, if you directly measure upwelling, sea surface temperature, something like that. You, it's going to give you the definitive trend that you want, I guess would be my answer. As an ecologist and a biologist, I'm just usually really interested in the effect that it'll have on the biology, which um, is sort of the seabirds of sentinels I, uh, idea. But uh, it's a great question, Peter, and I, um, <laughs> I need to think a little bit more deeply about that, to be honest. Yeah, thank you. So it's just about 12 now, and we have a question from the live audience. 